nice ride, by the way. Oh, thank you. You too. I love that we are having an intersection between friends right here. Because in a way, we know each other from like yeah. work and business. But here we go deeper. It's like you peel the onion, mm -hmm. keep going deeper and deeper. And why? Why are we who we are? Jorge, I want to hear that. I don't know your backstory. Well, the young Jorge. <laughs> before, before starting my business, because I, I, I really have had just this job. I, uh, but I had a, a, an actual job as a student uh, producing uh, telenovelas and what? producing musical theater. I and I, I graduated from there as a telenovela producer the same day that I graduated from my college. But then um, my, my boss fired me. The same day that I graduated, I went to him and told him, you know, now I'm free to work full time, I'm here. And he told me, you know, close the door, sit, okay. And, and he fired me, he said, but why? Oh my gosh. And he told me, you know, if you keep working in corporate, uh, one day they will forget what you did and they will replace you with another producer and another writer. So go on and start something on your own. Oh and that is when I, you know, uh, talked to my brother. My brother was already, uh, you know, kind of making comments to me. We should, we should start a business together. So we came together and with all pennies and pesos that we had at that time in Mexico, we uh, put together a, a magazine. We wanted to do a magazine about success. And I said, I, we need to get closer to successful people to have real examples of success and real examples of leaders. And so that's why we started doing interviews mm -hmm. that we started publishing. And then after publishing, we launched our first uh, magazine in 1991 wow. in Mexico. So quit, the, the boss that fired you, he didn't fire you. He set you up for your future success, which is so cool. And I'm That's still so consider cool. him one of my biggest mentors. That's we so are great. very close friends still. He was one of those that changed uh, your life. But the magazine was not easy to start. It requires a lot of money, which we didn't have. But it came with an opportunity uh, when we uh, did a uh, we proposed an interview with the president of Mexico and they told us, no, never, that's impossible. But you can interview his part, uh, you know, private secretary and you can interview his wife and you can build a story around that. And we did that. Mm. And, and when, when we, we wrote the entire story of the president of Mexico, they saw this and they decided, well, the only thing that this story needs it's an actual conversation with the president. Yeah. So that's the way we got it. The guy was the president, so the magazine got like a, an immense publicity. And he was the one who told us, what's the future of your business? What are you gonna do? Uh, we love our culture, the Latin culture. So we, we let's go to Colombia, let's go to Argentina, we, let's go to Peru and, and make magazines there, like the same way we did it in Mexico. Mm. And he told us, no, in 20 years from now, Mexico will be more related to the US and Canada than it will be related to the Latin American countries. So go north. We said, well, we don't even speak English well. How are we <laughs> gonna get there and start a business, a magazine, something? So we passed like the first three years or four years touring the country. 1990, we took the decision of launching Latino leaders here in the U.S. And that's when we started making interviews and, and stories and all that. It was, it was great. Gosh. How about you? you? Oh my gosh. Your country, Colombia, is Yeah, so we fabulous. both have we both have the immigrant story that we share, right? And I think that shapes you different because you get the, the value of perspective, right? And when I came to the States, um, I was 17 mm -hmm. by myself without speaking a word of English, with a student visa in one hand and a suitcase in the other. And I came to Texas of all places. That's where I learned how to speak Texan. I think at the beginning people were like, oh, she's so quiet, pobrecita, doesn't know how to speak English. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, oh my gosh, there she is again on the stage talking. <laughs> it's like, stop her. 
But I was, I was just excited to, to lead and create things. And when, when was what you realized that you wanted, I mean, you said, well, this is my path. This yeah. is my, 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 my future is here. The younger version of me was obsessed with the corporate C-suite before 40. Fast forward later, later when I graduated, so I got the great opportunity to be at Johnson & Johnson for 10 years. That was really my biggest formative years as a corporate executive. Um, became one of the youngest executives ever at, a, at that level in the company, uh, with a global marketing position in the pharmaceutical sector, which is the biggest, most prominent part of the business. And in that journey and in that quest, my business curiosity was what showed me that there was a, a gap when I saw that nobody was looking at the shifting demographics of our country. I mean, you know this very well, that in barely two decades, we're gonna be a majority minority country. When I started looking at the numbers for my own categories of business, as we were launching new products and working for the big plans for J&J, &J, I said, we, we're gonna miss our numbers unless we do something about the shifts in the market, in the consumers, in the people we serve. And nobody had thought about it that way. That was like over a decade ago. And that's when I said, you know what? Let me create the company that I can't find to hire. It was cultural curiosity, Jorge, that really made me look at numbers and opportunity in a way others were not looking at. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something special. I'm sure you've seen that pattern in all the leaders you've covered of something bigger than yourself that is moving you to do what you do. Mm -hmm. Chasing money is never gonna be enough. Mm -hmm. Or chasing title is always gonna leave you unfulfilled. But when you're really pursuing that purposeful vision that honors the integrity of who you are, mm -hmm. it just carries you differently, right? Um, you've mentioned two people, or in your story you have two people that in an unexpected way, mm -hmm. clear the path for your purpose to kind of unfold. Yeah. So that boss from Televisa that said, sorry kid, not here. And the president of Mexico actually pushed you to like go to the United States. So people, yeah. how has people like that shaped you and guide you? One of the things that I am most proud and believe me, I, I will have to bring this with me when, when I die. Leaders are not, you know, like gods or extraordinary people. They're just an ordinary people with an extraordinary determination. That's it. The most common element that we have found in 34 years of interviewing leaders is determination, is will to keep going. Mm. Not quitting on what is your dream or what is your, your objective in life. I think that that little anxiety that everybody has to become successful, to do something, to, to be more, to be in that position, to pursue a C-suite, you know, it, with not obsessing, but having the discipline to be able to get there little by little using your skills, it's a legacy that you're leaving behind. You don't, you don't need to leave a foundation. You don't need to leave like a big bank, bank account. It's just your own story should be your own legacy. Yeah. So in that sense, have you, ever, have you ever thought of that? Oh my gosh, all the time. The younger version of me was chasing title, right? And then when I kind of like switched and it was my entrepreneurial route is highly purposeful. What am I doing? I'm impacting the biggest boardrooms and brands in the world so that we make cultural intelligence part of business, period, clear. Then in that, I realize how much influence we have, how much your story and mine can inspire the next generation of leaders. Mm -hmm. And in that journey, I realized that my legacy and what I wanna do is continue to empower and inspire people to achieve their full God-given potential. And the other thing as a mom, I know you're a dad too, as a mom, I always want to, when I look at my two little boys, I think about, okay, my legacy will be that I was able to raise two great human beings. 
And that, for us that are parents, is probably the biggest gauge of success and legacy because those kids are a reflection, as you said, of what we do, not what we said. And that makes the legacy continue. I never thought, and I'm so grateful to this experience and to Avondale for making me think beyond the machine, to look at the intersection of humanity, people, craftsmanship, design, and engineering, all under the same kind of premise. And um, I know we each got to drive these amazing cars. I was on the Continental, dark blue, beautiful like tan interior. I was totally nerding out on this car <laughs> as I was driving. It's an experience. It's not just a machine. And I think we all can learn a lot yeah. from that as people. How about, how was your experience in the Ghost? How did it feel? Well, let me tell you, since I was a little kid, mm -hmm. Rolls Royce for me was like the car, right? There's no other better car than a Rolls Royce. And I agree with you. I mean, it is like with a good, you know, piece of art. You think of all the things that are behind that. Yeah. So, Jorge, I have enjoyed this conversation so much. I am so glad Avondale brought us together. Who knew? We should continue. I, I, I would love to drive the car that you are driving. Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's go to the car yeah. and continue there. Let's go for a ride, amigo. <gasps>